happy to have uh, a local scholar, Dr. Abbas Jimchi, who's just finished his doctoral degree in comparative literature at the University of Maryland, College Park. His dissertation maps the trajectories um, of the representation of Arabs as the other in Persian and Parsi literary traditions. He's published on ethnocentric tendencies in modern Persian literary criticism. I most recently finished drafting an article on Shia passion plays as now, uh, and how historically they were used as an apparatus for representing Sunnis as the other in, of the Shiites in Iran. So we actually um, met when we were discussing uh, issues of Shiites, of uh, Sunnis in Iran, which is another topic, which maybe <laughs> when, you, when you are ready to present about that, you can come back and tell us about that issue because it's so fascinating. But we're eager to uh, see what you have to say today. So thanks very much for coming. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so, um, I put a note for myself to start with a disclaimer that like the material that I'm going to present is controversial for many people because it um, presents like an overview of some of the most like problematic stuff that nowadays we call it at the century. Many people call it racist, uh, but uh, you'd be surprised that in uh, Persian studies and scholars still haven't started doing that. So, before I um, uh, like bombard you with quotes and um, <laughs> texts. I'm going to start with some beautiful Persian miniatures. Not just because merely they are beautiful, because this is Sa'ad ibn Abi Wafas, the Arab general in the Qadsiya, um, finally uh, killing uh, Rostam al the uh, Sasanian general. Now I took this. Um, picture myself in India in 2012, and I was amazed at how, despite what we come to understand nowadays, that the Arabs and Iranians are so separate, and um, superiority, inferiority, informing that separation, of course, um, these two are like, have the same standing. Even their skin colors are like, very much like each other. So I started looking for other representations of, or depictions of the Odyssey. The same scene, you'll see, but just very quickly, I'm going to give you like a few, starting chronologically, of course. This is uh, thanks to the wonderful uh, like archive of the Shahnama project at the Cambridge University. You'll see that this is like 17th century, and then moving on against 17th century, and you will see that uh, like the Persian general is uh, killed in Badly. And basically what is driving uh, the topic uh, hand is this great line verse, like Beta Musalbar in Persian, um, uh, uh, like art criticism. Uh, it basically is uh, just hit him and kill him. So merely hit him and kill him is depicted. Or here you will see that there are like certain historicism is, has started to inform these uh, rep historical representations that the headdresses are different. And sometimes they get creative. And sometimes they emphasize the stature, the uh, emerging stature apparently of Sadiq Abu Bakas by painting him larger than life. Another very interesting uh, development is that Sad, the Arab general, sometimes turns into a saint. And you will see that if you compare like the flags and also uh, like the standing and also the tail here, you will see that over time, like 17th, 18th century is complicated basically uh, by artists. We don't know, know we don't know much about these artists, but these are the things that have um, survived, and they are amazing. Um, mid 18th century is the earliest that I have been able to find an Arab that is um, like very like realistically depicted, and um, not not only in physiognomy but also in stature as a as a hero, as a as a winning hero. And this is Rosan Farasad, like uh, obviously they are following the traditions of a uh, coffee house painting, if you're familiar with that. 
is a uh, like Shahnameh tradition, like very Shahnameh-like figure, and like the regalia that he has, everything that on him comes from Rustam from the Shahnameh. And he's also named Rustam. Uh, in this manuscript, I was curious to see whether like are other Arab represent representations of the Arab uh, or not, so I was very lucky that we have them here, like very pious, like beautifully rendered. Still, I, I guess we're not able to see any meaningful difference that would feed into like modern perceptions about like Persians being superior to Arabs as modern writers tell us. And this is Alexander in Mecca. And this is Nebuchadnezzar. How come? I don't know. So the same manuscript has this rebel Arab hero that wants to abduct and rape the Persian princess, damsel in distress motif, but of course is captive, is uh, is arrested and punished. Uh, we will come uh, to this like damsel in distress a lot in modern texts. Now we are at the end of this like my manuscript section. We are. Um, in the late 18th century, early 19th century, you will see that the Arab is um, fully fleshed out. The skin color has changed, but still he is like very like um, unbiasedly presented, like without any discrimination. Continuing the tradition, unfortunately we come to the 19th century, early 20th century, late 19th century and early 20th century, and this is how the same Shahnama tradition under Reza Shah, this is uh, like 20s, 1920s, uh, the headpiece on the front page is this. Now compare this with the previous ones, you will see that the Arab has developed this note. He's barefooted, he's riding a camel, barefooted again, you see? And uh, the elephant is emphasized. This is the Persian tank at the time, and camel everywhere. Like these, what I will hopefully uh, try to show you, turn into fetishes over time. Mm -hmm. Now, again, quickly, in this particular manuscript, you will see that the Arabs are made to sit on the floor, and the Persians are so like stately and so opulent in their uh, like um, demeanor, and. Uh, Camel versus like Persian tanks, and the caption says, Omar, this is Omar the Khattab, the syndicate uh, in the mosque, dividing the booties. This is Omar the Khattab, and um, again, like damsel in distress, like what the fantasy of like uh, the Arab other wanting to violate the Persians. Now we will we will hear about these women uh, more, and of course uh, the picture would be incomplete without Omar ibn Khattab paying for what he did to Iran, because the conflicts of Iran happened during his time. So uh, the age of modern Persian nationalism, all well, like this, is a very good sample. Um, the Persian slave Fijuza uh, Abu Lublo kills. Him. The same manuscript has another like uh, imaginative uh, manuscript, and it took me like a year to find this. No kidding. So this is this is this is amazing, and this is by the way the ruins of the last uh, Sasanian palace uh, in the Tisfahan area, like modern day Iraq. So it took me a while to find it, but I found in a journal. So you see, like there are like intertextualities. People are um, like they know each other and they follow each other. And the caption says that this is um, is uh, this is a historical depiction, purportedly that people should look and learn from a brat, right? And again, you see the damsel in distress, uh, like very European-like, being violated by I don't know, uh, like. Uh, demons and the palace is in fire. This is um, historical. We don't know if that happened or not, but basically, who cares? 
Uh, the final point is this, um, how uh, the very renowned uh, like modern writer, like the Hemingway of Persian, modern Persian literature, Salavet, he, he, for those who know his signature, this is signed and this is also signed here. And this is how the Arab, other, the Arab has emerged as the other of the Persian people and uh, you can compare it to European uh, text very easily and have the caricaturish, caricaturish uh, depictions and uh, representations have, uh, they have about uh, like the Orientals or the more rich things or um, the, about the Arabs themselves. So again, you see the fetish of Berkude, of course, it's a lizard that lives in the desert and the only book that cares for him is uh, the Quran. And uh, again, the dunes, the desert, um, uh, the Shator, uh, Camel, and uh, the coat that this, you see, he, he, like less than human, very, very animalistic. So hopefully you have asked this question by now from yourself, that what happened in the past millennium that led to the change in, such a change in sentiments? What can we learn from earliest narratives of contact about Persians and Arabs engaged in the contact zone? What truths and discourses have been used for, to, for articulating these sentiments throughout the time? What has been the historical trajectories of the representation of, uh, of Arabs in Persian texts? And how, very importantly, they became the other of the Persian people, and how re-readings of classical texts gave rise to a question of ideologies uh, that created a palimpsestic, a palimpsestic quality for the representation of Arabs. Palimpsest means like more point later. So the, the first text that everybody in the Arabic tradition and the Persian tradition um, starts with is Tavares, like monumental history. Um, we see that there is uh, multiple narrations of this uh, encounter between the Persian king, uh, uh, Yazgir III, and the Arab emissaries. Uh, I don't have the time to read it, but I leave it to you to read it. But basically, he demeans and denigrates them based on their food, their dress, and basically their material culture that they are uncouth, that they are hungry. If you've come here, I think it's here or another section, that if you've come here to rob anything, I'm going to give you more than you expected, but please get that. In the Persian tradition, uh, we find basically the same thing, that in the Shahnameh, an amazing, amazing book uh, that versifies uh, like pre-Islamic texts, we see that uh, the general, Rostam uh, Khan, the Sultanian general that uh, was defeated, before uh, he is killed, basically says very harsh things about uh, the Arabs. He calls them, he basically ridicules them because of their physical features, dietary habits, and dressing style. Keep this in mind, we're going to get back to them repeatedly. And um, the quote is a shir shakur for them as the Zeshir Shukur for Danus Usmar translated by the Warner Brothers as the Arabs from drinking camel's milk and eating lizards have reached a pitch where the Persian throne is covered. Shame, tofu, shame, shame on circulating Arabs. So this will be, this will be read as history. Uh, not all, not among all Iranians. Uh, don't quote me on that. Nationalist Iranians. We will come to that. So, just to give you very, I'm surveying like a thousand years. I don't have the time to read all of these, but um, you're more than welcome to ask me to get back, like during the Q&A, to translate these. <coughs> Again, you see that, like an 11th century, like says that we eat chicken and lamb roasted. But you eat like uh, snakes, locusts, mice, and zap. Not an ordinary zap, not lizard, like a dead zap. Another one is this Nasser Postro, the like, renowned uh, philosopher who traveled to Mecca and he came across the Bedouin Arabs and he <coughs> found it very, uh, uh, he, he, he couldn't believe it that. Uh, certain Arabs, Bedouin Arabs, in their whole lives uh, had drunk uh, nothing but camel's milk. Again, you see camel's milk. Since in the desert there is nothing but uh, bitter scrubs eaten by the camels, they actually imagined that the whole world uh, was like that. So he uh, like, makes 
fun up there, I close my eyes. Along the way, whenever uh, my companies, uh, my companions saw a lizard, they killed. And, uh, so see, the, the Arab is basically reduced to its food, uh, like the arid uh, and um, uh, uncultivatable like uh, locality that it lives in, and so on and so forth. Uh, you may tell yourself that, like all the authors, that I'm going to quote are she's. No. Sometimes very pious Sunni Persian authors like Fabani Sharabani, if you read his poetry, very difficult poetry, you will see that he is uh, a very pious Sunni. He also traveled to Mecca and first hand experience. First travel was very like positive because he considered the Arabs as like the enlightened people, as the superior people. But over time, uh, apparently he changed his mind and came up with the ideas that he describes the Arabs as uh, like snakes <coughs> who have formed the chamber around Mecca because he loves Mecca so much. Sense of rivalry he uh, is um, uh, forcing him to say, I guess it's just only one. <coughs> Over time, um, like a sense of defeat, the Iranians were convinced by the elite. We don't have like any text left by the ordinary Iranians. We don't, like Iranians, I mean, like the elite, like the educated and the writers and poets and historians. They were convinced that they were defeated. And looking for uh, a reason of the defeat, they started doing something very interesting. From mid-19th century, Persian intellectuals were exposed to the ideology of nationalism. They learned it from European texts translated. They were consumed during this time by a dual desire for appropriating the glories of their country's ancient past. They started to discover, oops, we have a Persepolis. They didn't know anything about it. They had changed the name. They had kind of uh, turned it into a Muslim thing. They called it mosque. Solomon's mother's mosque, like Persepolis. This is before like um, Europeans come to Iran and convince them that no, you've got an ancient history. You have to be proud of it and disown your Islamic heritage. Only an elaborate reimplantment of the history of Iran can enable them to fulfill these contradictory desires. Um, in the new narrative that emerged in the works such as Machibar, like by Ahmed Zadeh and then Kermani, two like forefathers of Iranian nationalism, uh, the Arabs were recast in Persian history as the adversaries that stifled Iran's movement toward Korokre and civilization. You see, they are learning about these vocabularies and they import them into Persian. This reemployment resulted in the vilification of Arabs as the abominable people who terminated the ancient golden age of Iran. Again, the, uh, uh, the idea of golden age, and we are um, past that, so we have to get back to it by traveling back in time, uh, um, was a problem, was believed in Iran and they believed. Ushering an era of barbarity and slavery and ignorance. The new character and the role of the Arabs in early nationalist texts was largely based on what Akhundzade and Kermani had found in the Shahnameh. You see, when he wants to quote somebody that every that his Persian readers uh, know, he quotes what? He quotes this. And says that Rustam Farsad knew something because he had first hand experience. So it was reiterated uh, and he built on it. Anti Arab representation recurred with certain regularity in this work. Naked and hungry Arabs attacked Iran ostensibly only for plundering its riches. You see, one important thing that um, I can see here is that um, the Arab other, the Arab that is attacked us, the invading Arabs, is reduced to a bloodthirsty bandit, Rafsan Khan. They did not come to Iran to spread a new religion. They just only came here to um, rollers of Iran's riches. Now, to give you a sample, uh, it's very hard to uh, it's very hard to not to see like the sediments of this ideology of this thought in Persian literature. How come that nobody has discussed it? It is truly amazing. Introduction of Arabs in the narrative of decline of Persian history found a strong resonance in the works of modern writers such as Sadat Hidayat. 
he became, uh, he, I told you, he's like the most, he's so good, he's so creative, he's an amazing writer, but at the time, this is 20s, this is 30s, uh, 40s, this is the age of Aryanism, like anti-Semitism is, uh, is the only way, and Arabs are Semites today, Iranians at the time, so they are convinced that they are Aryans, like, and they bought the idea that they are Aryans, and they are so angry at Arabs because they see that, oh, Europeans have said, have talked about, like, uh, the bad Semites for a long time, so they appropriated the ideology and started repeating it. He became so profoundly preoccupied with the foregoing narrative that barefoot and marauding Arabs cast a lasting shadow over an important number of his works. His portrayal of Arabs is comparable to the way certain Europeans have represented Africans and all so-called Orientals as their inferiors. Like the first um, um, sparks of this research came to me after reading Edward Said's Orientals. So I told myself, okay, so whatever he says that about, like, the book has certain flaws, I'm aware of that. He, the, uh, the way that he discusses colonial discourse kind of reminded me of ooh, what we have in modern Persian literature, and even before that, not under the moniker of uh, like racism and racial, uh, and racial anthropology, but modern Persian literature is uh, like filled with these ideas, unfortunately. His legacy is preserved in different works, uh, most recently in Abbas and Arabs. And this is, this is a very important, uh, like many people ask me that Hey, Arab was just only a radical figure. By the way, the literature that I'm reviewing is a very, is a very radical um, statement. Uh, you may, one of the questions probably would be why I don't balance this by like, the people who are very respectful toward the Arabs. I haven't been able to find it. And I've looked. Like the attraction and repulsion? The repulsion runs high, but the attraction, I don't know, I haven't been able to find. And even those who are like egalit have a, a very egalitarian outlook are blamed for Arab Madori, that Arab centrism. So this uh, Abbas Amarafi, an expert in, in, in Berlin, has this wonderful, uh, like a feminist postmodern rewriting of Salah <coughs> Hidayat's Blind Out. Blind Out is, a very, is about a man uh, that kills a woman in the novel. And the woman, the ethereal woman in the novel, never talks. It's silent. So people have accused Hidayat of, uh, of uh, being bad, uh, uh, being cruel to women. So he re lets the woman talk, but still in his novel, the Arabs are barefooted, marauding, So Dada Hedayat was basically obsessed with the Arab other and aspects of, to him, aspects of Arab culture and Na'alain and, I don't know, uh, Ruben and Kafan, the Death Shroud and Abba uh, and uh, Arab Chin and like basically um, um, this is how he saw Islam uh, was uh, spread by, uh, by the Sultan and uh, the Hur from El Man coming from the Quran. And this is a Nar, this is hell, this is fire. You can, you can, bas you can very easily tell that he was, uh, his perceptions of Islam and the Arabs who brought this for him malady to Iran, quote unquote, um, they were humans. Uh, I should give a sample, but it would be like coding, like, in modern uh, political vocabulary, a white supremacist. I don't want to do that, I don't want to offend people. Uh, like I can give you references, you can do it yourself. But here, in order to give you an idea that what he thought, this is how he, um, in a story, beautiful story, I, I highly encourage you to read, uh, many of them have been translated in English uh, by scholars. Um, they are amazing, super creative, but at the, uh, the uh, like at the bottom of them, you will find this troubled individual, traumatized by the conquest of Iran, the Arab conquest of Iran, and he wants to just lash out at them and take revenge. So he uses his text as um, as a battle as a, as a battlefield to mount rhetorical wars against the Arabs. So a group of characters are traveling to Arabistan. So is that like Saudi Arabia or like Arabistan in Persian means Arab lands? 
So is there like a Shi shrines in Karbala area in, in present day back, uh, Iraq or in Arabistan, Saudi Arabia? We don't know. Another sign of his like very like um, stereotype, very homogenous, like out there. In the post-apocalyptic uh, post environment of this location, anywhere a pool of pungent water was found, an oasis. A family was formed around it. Representation of the local population is basically they are reduced to a cat. Well, what is very important is that, like I read this, like following Edward Said, is that um, you know, we can we can. Uh, this is the narrative just stops uh, in order the writer to give an obsessive and neurotic catalog of the things that he just found as signs of alterity of the Arab body. <coughs> and of course this is what he said. I don't have the time, but uh, if you're interested, ask me about uh, how in, uh, uh, in modern one, like an amazing like Rumi, like um, Mulana was uh, coded out of context uh, in order to demean and denigrate the Arabs. This is this is a, an Arab that goes to the Persian king in order to give him a gift, but Hedayat tortures that and turns him into what he loves. Actually, I have included something about Sunni other <laughs> because in my reading, uh, I started with the uh, like um, Arabophobia, and then over time. Like gravitated toward the otherness of the Arab, uh, and the more I studied the thing, I saw similarities with how the Sunnis have been uh, like represented in, in Shi'i literature, and by certain Shi'is. Now, um, I want to be very clear about this. You will find the word "certain" many times in my presentation because not all Shi'is are madly angry at Sunnis. I didn't say that. Don't quote me on that. So, this is Shi fashion play. This is the Imam uh, raising the standard of Islam. And these are the bad uh, people who are just running to kill him, stop him. They usually have, uh, they put on gaudy like uh, colors, but very bright and shiny colors in order to mark them so that people looking at them would understand that this is uh, like. The white is the dead shroud, like Prophet Muhammad, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the dead shroud, and green is Prophet Muhammad's you know, color of Islam's color. I'm confused, is this a reenactment or is this from a film? Uh, this is the yearly reenactment oh. of the uh, tragedy of Kaaba. Oh, okay, oh, this is from Tunnel. Okay, yes. And these are like the spectators in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, um, like after the uh, age of nationalism, Reza Shah uh, like, banned these because he considered them as unmodern, and he wanted to present a very like post-religious image of Iran. So he basically banned them, but did not completely ban them. So the Tazia makers, they call them Tazia in Iran, mm -hmm. I'm going to discuss that, moved to the rural areas and Tazia survived. And Tazia is an amazing institution. We should talk about it because basically drama, uh, uh, dramatic traditions like music survived through this under the Safavids. So that's very important. To this day, certain like musical styles, movements, and uh, even acting styles we owe them to the Tazi. So general information. Elevation of Shiism as Iran's official religion by the Safavids in 1502 generated intense intellectual activity in Iran. A pattern of identification and disidentification of self and other with the same pattern of us versus them may be distinguished in certain Shi uh, rituals and practices such as Tazi performances. You see the word certain. Certain discourse of othering generated irreducible differences between Shi'is and Sunnis, uh, leaving little room for in between positionalities. This is uh, very important that. Um, even to this day, you will see that the debate between uh, Iran and its regional, uh, uh, its neighboring Arab nations leaves little room for in between positionality. You're either with us or them, when you respond. Important precepts in this text is that believers must acknowledge among the saints claim to caliphate, 
ولایت پروژه and denounce reigning caliph Yazid ibn Muawiyah for depriving Hussein of his right. The other side of the coin of Walaya is Baro'a. With Walaya, you pledge allegiance with your Imam. You say that I love you and I will do everything for you. The other side of the coin is that I will call your enemy as my enemy. Baro'a, dissociation. Certain Shi'i sovereigns, see again, certain Shi'i sovereigns use the rituals and practices associated with these commemorative ceremonies as an instrument of religious indoctrination. Basically, the Shi fashion plays were like the cable TV of the time. They were, they were like the state, uh, they were like the national TV. They used it in order to spread the message of the new religion. And over time, of course, as a vehicle for conquering the Sunni other. Uh, like anybody else, they understood the effect and the influence and the outreach of their institution uh, on the people and they use that to their benefit. We will see a couple of pictures of how popular they were. <coughs> now, the historical personages of the Karbala narrative I um, fought all the time, bifurcated into my rooms. This is, this is me trying to make sense of um, an ethnic configuration behind the religious debate. The good Arabs and the bad Arabs, because, by the way, all the characters in the Karbala narrative that are reenacted today in Iran are Arabs, right? We don't have any Iran yet again. So uh, the bad Arab over time like is where the Sunni other kind of finds its place. This dual process endeavor to mythify the good Arabs as larger than life heroes with superhuman abilities, like Hussein at the time was 53 years old, but in these Tazias or in the uh, uh, like pictorial depictions, he is like a twins hero, so he's very idealist. And the bad Arabs as a exoticized outsiders situated outside human civilization. And the theory of, um, this is still a work in progress, but uh, like cultural critics, by reading like a colonial, like people like Said or Holy <coughs> or speak back, you will, you will um, find a space to see the dynamic of mimicry and mockery. It's very interesting, but some scholars find it very controversial to say such a thing about Shiism. The Arab there, in other words, in these performances, partially appropriated and partially disallowed. The status of the other was codified in a complex regime of representation that was perfected over some 200 or 300 years. We don't know for sure. European accounts, we don't, I, I personally don't, don't trust that much the European accounts because they are very like pious and orthodox Christians, <coughs> mostly missionaries who come to Iran, and the way that they pick these new like um, heretical sect, she's, is not very realistic. I don't, we, we should learn from them, but we should take them with a grain of salt, or read them with a grain of salt. From their physical features and costumes to their singing style and interpersonal traits, the good Arabs arguably are reconstituted with what has been meaningful and inspiring, this is William Lima, for the Persians in their culture and civilization. For example, if a good Arab, like if he sings, he usually quotes Rumi and Hafiz and all the beautiful poetry of uh, like the people, what's that people care and have grown up with. So he becomes a friend. But if they sing, they basically don't sing. They just shout on purpose. That's the standard. This, there, there are certain words that like the practitioners use. They call it disharmonic, bihahang, or they call it poshtolongwar. They just basically shout in a very angry sense in order to make it clear for the audiences that I am a bad person. And it's very interesting that they don't even have the ambition of presenting a realistic picture. These are pious, super practicing Shi'is. But his profession is also as a performer, not an actor. This is not supposed to be an act. This is a performance, right? <sighs> So, um, 
filtered through the matrices of Persian culture, affectionate representation of good Arabs let them tap into the audience's collective consciousness as these characters started to share Persian culture's cherished ideas through the process of Persianizations. Persianization. As a result, anything abhorred and despising the ideal Iranian life had to be projected on a new entity in the narrative of Karabakh, what I call the bad Arabs, um, the performers simply can't sing it. Commodified as objects of Baro'a, and this is a very uh, like uh, unfortunate aspect of um, certain Shi rituals and performances, and I will be commenting on it uh, for a, a few minutes at the end of this presentation, how in contemporary one, in the past 10, 20 years, uh, a movement has started, uh, a group of scholars, uh, uh, religious thinkers, uh, uh, clerics, and idols, you won't believe it, have started talking about this specific aspect of cursing Baro'a. Because to some people, to some she is cursed, oh sorry, but I dissociate, the, the easiest way to dissociate from the enemy of your imam is to curse them. And some people take it to the next level by using four letter words. So uh, there is a huge debate inside Iran, and um, uh, I can talk about it in the Q&A, about who has commented on it and what. Commodified as objects of bad Arabs, ah, the bad Arabs, the, the moment that the bad Arabs or the some other appears on the on the stage, people start dissociating. And they like perform in a super exaggerated manner. He's not trying to be funny, he's trying to be very scary. Because he is the person that is going to be head the same. So people absolutely hate him. And like the 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 good Arabs uh, at Qiyya, or the pious, and Ash Qiyya, that's what they call them in Iran, like the, the bad ones. And they basically have blood on their hands, and the whole thing is blood. And these are like the bad Arabs that are coming like in a very um, aggressive manner. That's, that's the only thing that they know. Uh, let me finish with this and show you the pictures. Uh, Commodified as objects of Baro'a, the bad Arabs were disavowed and discredited in these performances so much so that they were even believed to reside outside the religion. So it's very common, like uh, like in the older text, like in the uh, 17th and 18th century, uh, to call them Kafar, Mushrik, and Mulhid. They are not. They are not. Yazid is not Kafar. He is another Muslim fighting another Muslim, right? Cousins. Over time, the pantheon of others. Uh, in Tazia performances expanded to include anything that was perceived to be against the family of the Prophet after Bayt uh, or Shiism in general. Uh, like it, they found it very easy to basically mount a fight against their uh, like perceived enemies, uh, uh, the Imam, like the Ottoman Sunnis, <coughs> or Uzbek Sunnis, like very warrior-like, like the main enemies of the Safavid. <coughs> Historical tyrants, um, Ali's, uh, this is the caliph, caliph Ali's assassin, and the Sunni caliphs uh, that uh, would focus on Omar ibn Khattab, um, who emerged as the like the mitten there, like the uh, the symbol of Sunnism, are some of the personalities that have come to populate this category. Now, uh, in late. Uh, um, mid 19th century this was built this is taki Dolat, the royal amphitheater in tehran and um, several europeans uh, like visited this and it was like um, like protocol uh, that any uh, ambassador coming to run would be invited to this to see the glory of these um, uh, uh, of these performances and uh, if you read the uh, uh, travelogues of european travelers you will see that it was uh, um, spectacular and it housed 20,000 people and it was packed and we have uh, numerous reports of like an equal amount of people number of people were left behind closed doors but under Reza Shah of course it went uh, it was left in disuse and was uh, used temporarily as the burial place of the last Qajar king 
This is a modern one, uh, but as I said, mostly nowadays it is popular in rural areas, uh, like the first picture. If you Google Tazia or Shi Passion Place, hundreds of these images from. I don't have to show them here. But one thing is for sure that like very clear cut uh, like color coding uh, representing the ideas or ideologies behind these uh, at the heart of these people marks them because the people who are sitting at the back would understand who is doing what. <coughs> The result was modification of good Arabs, and we have a number of things that um, very quickly I'm going to touch on them. So there is this. Um, oh, this one is oh, okay. So this is a demon uh, that we see him in Solomon <coughs> episodes because Solomon can speak with the demons. He ruled the demons, and uh, this is a young Ali, and uh, that was able to tie the. Um, thumbs of the demon 30,000 years ago and the demon is so uh, frustrated that goes to uh, Prophet Muhammad and asks him to help me uh, and untie me. He cannot. Omar comes, cannot. Uh, Osman comes, cannot. All the important figures of the Sunni say come, they cannot. Of course the audience dissociate, they curse them Finally, Ali comes, boom, does it. And pay attention to the like the skin color difference and barefooted. It's very interesting. Oh, so this, the result was, um, so this is Shas Bastanidi binding the demon souls. And another fascinating aspect of this Shi'i uh, um, Pasha place is that, is this uh, <coughs> the daughter of the last Sasanian king, Shashman, <coughs> the lady of the land. Um, has an apocryphal marriage to Hussein. And we can talk about this. This is how critics argue that, like the Far, <coughs> the pre Islamic concept of the Western concept of Far, like the, the glory of the, the kingly glory, traveled to the descendants of Hussein. So the Shi'i Imams are um, respected in an Iranian sense as well. Shah Bonu's brother, this is a little creative because. Uh, the last Sasanian king did not have a son, Abdullah, named Abdullah, but this is creative writing. Uh, Shah Khan's brother attempted to rescue Hussein, and Abdullah symbolizes, my reading symbolizes the ideal Persian warrior fulfilling the dream of helping the beleaguered among Hussein and Karbala, because Persians could not help, right? And just put yourself in their shoes at the moment that they are mourning Hussein's death, that they could not help that unfortunate event, they could not stop that unfortunate event. So they created this Abdullah and defined Abdullah in a number of um, uh, late 19th century um, uh, performances. And so Shah Banu uh, presents, sets in motion an elaborate substructure of rivalry between Ali and Omar, like the two like figureheads of the two sects. And uh, in these um, like late 19th century uh, performances, you can, like, religious animosity runs parallel to an ethnic rivalry with the Arabs. It, it is not my argument. If you read it, you will see that, for example, Abdullah says, uh, I can't, like, Shahbani is taken captive, remember, and brought to the mosque, to Omar, and Omar wants to mistreat her. Ali intervenes and says that no, she is a prince. But this is not his. This, you cannot find this in any historical source. This is invented and fabricated. But I don't know. So Omar says okay, and Ali says that okay, you're a prince. Uh, just choose your husband, and she chooses Hussein. So before doing that, um, Omar is about like the bad guy here is about to disrespect the, uh, the Zoroastrian princess. And uh, Ali, like a thundering cloud, comes and um, says terrible things to uh, the caliph, the reigning caliph, and you can imagine how it reverberated uh, uh, among the audiences who were doing this pious obligation of battle association. 
and this is the text that I told you and this is the, the king learning about um, and this is mid 19th century like with, there is no date ever on this uh, manuscript I found it was very lucky to find it and this is Shah Banu, like uh, elevated to the status of a saint and speaking with the vizier and in this particular thing like horses coming from like the epic tradition are very important for the Persian writers and hallelujah like Hussein's horse actually Hussein before dying says that you're my great wife take my horse go to the one and find somebody to help me this is not history this is like uh, um, creative writing another very interesting aspect of this is the European ambassador who is defending Hussein <coughs> in the plains of Karbala, arguing against the reigning caliph and saying that, no, just forgive him, don't kill him. Of course, he pays a dear price, he is killed, and Hussein is also killed. As targets of Barat, the bad Arabs were subjected to ritualistic acts of dissociation, curses, and madness. And this is the aspect that has alienated many Sunni um, like religious leaders and even countries because of what they find in Iran even still to this day. Uh, a tactic for discrediting the bad Arabs was to have professional comedy troops play them, like ridicule them, satirize them. Hmm? This allowed comedy to enter these performances. Like from a historical standpoint, these um, Shi Pasha plays are amazing. They are one. They are the one and only uh, dramatic tradition that you can find in Muslim countries that has been documented for the past at least 300 years. So, as far as the aesthetic and the dramatic aspect are concerned, they are amazing. But they, over time, absorb <coughs> a tremendous amount of apocryphal material and. You'll be surprised if you read um, the Ayatollahs, the Shi'i Ayatollahs' responses to the outlook toward uh, the Shi'i passion place, they despise it. Not because of religious reasons, because they over time gave uh, uh, an occasion for certain people to start flagging themselves, to start like. Um, putting the dagger to themselves to bleed for the same. These are like unorthodox, uh, or to go half naked in order to express their mourning. Like I do not hate this. And to this day, it's completely divided. Half of them are happy because it, it spread the message of Shiism and Islam, but half of them are still against it and saying that no, it's more damage than like anything else. The ultimate stage of this discourse of othering involved dehumanization of the bad guys. I see, to be honest, we did the same practice like uh, like this one. The Sunni other or the bad Arab, as I call it in my research, basically arrives uh, is basically depicted in a very caricaturish manner. As like you can see this, they usually cast very hulking even dark skinned like somebody these are like the, uh, I've been able to find these like descriptions from the margin of like very old manuscripts so the ultimate stage of this discourse of other involves the humanization of the bad ass while portraying them in animalistic terms like Shem Shem represents a who killed Hussein uh, is the, the very despised individual um, in Iran among the um, um, practicing Shias. So, in one um, performance, he is made to say this about himself. That, look at my seven nipples. That he calls himself a dog. Why? Because he's a pious, like the actor, the performer is a pious Shi, right? He is, this is amazing. This is like, um, like a Brechtian moment of distancing yourself from the role and actually talking to the people that no don't pelt me with stones I'm just an actor they had to do this otherwise there are accounts that super unhappy she is mourning they actually like um, invaded the stage and killed an actor who killed Hussein so realistically that they thought that 
he is the real champ. These are historical facts. And that Nasser Dishan had to intervene. The king had to intervene. And the end point of this, this is the only one that we have. So um, this is supposed to be a, an effigy of Omar ibn Khattab. And this is Omar Kushan, like the killing uh, Omar in effigy. A very um, uh, unfortunate practice among certain Shias. You can, you can tell from this that it's not very popular. And from the accounts, you will always see that. I can talk about it. I, I actually spoke with somebody in Iran uh, about, that still does this. So um, ask me about it um, through the phone. Um, um, so this is the ultimate stage of like um, dehumanization of the other that um, Omar is turned into a, an effigy filled with cookies, of course. And they just rush to it, um, just gush it, and are rewarded with sweets, and then set it to fire. And this is very important. I want to finish with this um, with a positive note. I started with a positive note in Persian manuscripts, <coughs> and this is me trying to be not <laughs> pessimistic. I'm a very optimistic person. Despite the gradual demise of the Tazia tradition, and this, even to this uh, today in Iran, Tazia is no longer popular. It's in rural areas, it is, but uh, since government um, subsidizes the performances, more and more people are getting away from it. A displacement and displacement of its uh, role as a system for imagining the other in Persian culture and society, um, principle of Bayra continues to be an important precept in Iran. Some call it, uh, some call for its orthodox practice. Um, so, over time, in the past like five, six, ten years, I've been able to collect something like seventy books that are written about Vahdat um, and Tabrit. They call it in Iran, unity and convergence. That is basically about how to uh, like approach the Sunni other and rehabilitate this, the, the status of the Sunnis as citizens of Iran. Hmm? Something that many people forget. Some call for its orthodox, but still there are people that just show, they say, no, we have to, uh, I don't know, um, follow the Quran, we have to follow so and so imams. They were so angry at the, I don't know, the person at Omar who um, purportedly. Uh, killed uh, Fatima and just uh, just um, uh, um, took the garden, the disputed garden from here, and still to this day it's it's alive uh, in the hearts of many people. Some call for its orthodox practice in modern Iran and politics based on what may be gleaned from the Quran and Islamic tradition, while others recommend re-evaluating re its application, Baro'a's application, dissociation, cursing applications in modern Iran in a global context. So globalism and um, like modern politics is also in coming um, to these believers. The principle of Baro'a is reinterpreted by the second group as an anti-colonial and anti-imperialistic tendency rather than an anti-Sunni principle. This has very interestingly excluded the Sunnis from the category, category of the other and has placed European colonialism, I'm sorry, the Americans, as the other of the sheep. In the new literature that is emerging, uh, geopolitical considerations seamlessly enter doctrinal discussions as socially conscious writers. This is new. Like before that, the texts are only religious debates, are religious polemics. There is no history. The only history that they have is that they are doing a chronological study of the like the traditions. Now, ISIS enters the discussion, and parties, and ISIS's or Daesh's parties for killing Shias, who dissociate against uh, Omar, becomes important. Scares people. They start. Revisit. This is this is amazing. In the new literature that is emerging, geopolitical considerations seamlessly enter doctrinal discussions. As socially conscious writers recommend tolerance towards Sunnis in an effort to put social and political expediencies, maslahat, side by side, if not ahead of religious obligations. Contextualizing, or in other words, like asking the believers that think about the consequences before doing that. They actually say that. Contextualizing certain Shi'i rituals against certain 
she rituals of piety so that they are more compatible with necessities of modern not. They say that always um, remember that in the mosque that you're sitting, in the party that you are dissociating, there may be Sunni brothers. You don't want to offend them, right? So instead of doing that as um, jali publicly, do it khafi inside yourself. Don't verbalize it. Mutual respect and peaceful <coughs> coexistence, actually, um, among all Muslims becomes important. This shift in discourse creates opportunities for reconciliation with the Sunnis as controversial practices like cursing, land and sab, um, sab is sahaba, of course, sab is preserved for the caliphs, Sunni caliphs, are, uh, with the focus on Umar ibn Khattab, are re-evaluated for the damage they do to the Shi'i Sunni relations with countries like Saudi Arabia. They actually say that. And Iran's national interests and uh, large. And you, you may think that these are like underground writers that are publishing on blog. No! These are government-sponsored publications. And what you find in them is not something that all the time follows the narrative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. These are very brave people. There are like two dozen writers that they publish. They have published, as far as I know, what is close to 70 books. Like these are only, uh, these are the books that are published in the past five years with a focus on cursing Sunnis. Not just only about anything, only cursing practices in Iran. And this has the devil, like cursing is the, like the devil would do it because it hurts Muslim community. And this has uh, like land, hoina muhaddas, unholy curses. And the subtitle says that uh, basically the writer wants to um, define the limits of cursing. And this has been in 11 imprints, 11 edition. I have the 11 edition. And Nohomer Rabi, Jehalat Ha Chesarat Ha. And Nohomer Rabi is again another made up um, festivity that supposedly Omar ibn Khattab was killed. So after the Shi'i Passion Place that people have mourned for two months, they have a feast like the fanatic Shi'is still live today. And I've spoken with one of them. I can share my uh, uh, my knowledge. And, but the title of the book says "Nohomer Rabi, Jehalat Ha, Ignorances and Damages." And another sub and man from as Manzare Fiqh and Manzahib Islami, my cursing and um, uh, anatomizing the the Sunni other uh, from the point of, from the viewpoint of um, Shari, Islamic Sharia and. The title of this one is, is beautiful, is that Zarurat like the necessity of friendship. Yeah. Isn't it that the ulama of the Muslim world avoid cursing and mm -hmm. doing to fear? So it's the title of, an, it's a big title, but you, it, it, it speaks to me. And the back of the book, and I finish with this, is um, without mentioning ISIS, the back of the uh, uh, the writer in a paragraph says that to the Iranian writers, you've seen the caricaturish uh, endpoint of anatomizing and demonizing the Shi'is. Don't do this inside the country. Thank you very much.
say it's, it's they're, that they're from the wealthier class, uh, they're, they're not necessarily the most educated, but they have a literary bent. I wonder if the, these great, great writers that you speak Thank of... Thank you. Very, very good question. I can, I can say two things. Um, but my, my personal background from Shin Sunni backgrounds, I've seen, I, I'm convinced that ordinary people have tremendous amount of tolerance for each other. Politicians and religious leaders create these like demarcations and red lines and this, this is Sunni, this is Shia. Now, above these ordinary people, you will find certain ayatollahs and uh, clerics. You can very much, I can very much argue that the religious institution in Iran is producing this. This is not an, like an outlawed or banned group of writers that are now in prison. No, <laughs> I didn't say that. You can, they are not. I actually text them every day through Telegram and WhatsApp. And they respond. And they are so happy that there are people reading their books because these books are published like in a thousand or two thousand like um, copies at a time in, a, in one edition. So still, these are not the ideal thing that we want. These are like the first baby steps. Yeah. There's still inside group conversation. Um, one thing that is strangely missing is that, okay, so you argue from a Sharia standpoint for the rehabilitation of the status of the Sunnis, but what about their civil rights? They never mention that because they are not experts. They are yeah, like ayatollahs, they are clerics. And the only thing that they know is to argue from within the tradition. Uh, as a, is it only performed during Muharram, Tesla yes. and Ashura, yes. or is it performed throughout the whole year? Very, and another very good question. So uh, we have reports, whether we can, I don't know whether we can believe them or not. So it started uh, with the 10 days of Muharram, like from the day one and, and 10th day that Hussein is actually killed. Um, th these are the main days that are performed right now in Iran. But we have reports that the, two, the whole month of Muharram uh, like teamed with these representations, starting from the, from the biblical times, um, like Abraham and Adam and Eve, and the whole thing. And I told you, this um, passion place where, like sponge, they basically absorb a tremendous amount of material. Many of them are biblical. And people are okay with it because many of them are also mentioned in the Quran. There are European reports that are surprised that these performances were like basically entertainment uh, at part at times, were so popular that certain Shi'i sovereigns had asked the performers to perform throughout the year. It's like the Broadway, it's like the cable TV that anytime that you turn it on. So nowadays, no. Nowadays, it's, it's, it's a, we call it museum. It's a museum thing. It's protected. It's dying. Very few Iranians have the name Omar. I mean, it happens. Many what? Omar. They don't have that name. Yes. Omar Khayyam. Omar Sharif. Yes. They like, they like Omar Sharif, the actor. Hmm. But I mean, many Iranians like um, Salah, like the football player. It's, I, I said, uh, like ordinary Iranians basically live like mostly like above and beyond these like prejudices. Um, but when it comes to like religious leaders and you'll be surprised that um, like the Ayatollah Khomeini and Ayatollah Khamenei and I've looked into this, you cannot find a single sentence they utter against Sunnis. On the contrary, books are published anthologizing the uh, things that they have said uh, about unity and convergence. Does that translate into an improvement in the lives of the Sunni minority in Iran? No. Somebody told me that in Kurdistan, a, a male child who was born, it, can have, it cannot have the name Adnan, it cannot have the name Osama, because those are Arab Ooh, names. They don't want that on the birth certificate. I don't know about that, but another, another aspect, another challenge of working on Iran is that now, Experience tells us that the, and the Arab minority of Iran, the Arab Sunni minority, around, as a case in point, is very disenfranchised. We, we can see that. 
um, in any almost any aspect of their lives. Uh, but there is not a single document that you can find that says that okay, do not hire Arabs because they are Arabs and they have extra national ties. We don't have that. So any time that we want to talk about the Sunni minority or Arab minority of Iran, we are challenged with this fact of the the uh, the Islamic. Republic of Iran, the regime has done a wonderful job of protecting these documents. If they are doing this, which I suspect they are doing that, but we don't have the declassified like CIA documents, no, we don't have it anymore. I like your talk because you brought it up to date with ISIS. You have a lot of nuances, which is good. Thank you. So I found it very interesting. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yes, I love that story about Ali buying the government's mm. hands and not even the Prophet. Well, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, no, he this found very uh, I'm not talking this. So he's in psychologically. You're invaded by a country which brings religion. They're your blessers. They're your curses. Uh, they didn't particularly come to spread the faith. That's one view. They came to conquer and take over. Maybe so. Yeah. How do you reconcile the fact that your message has come? through a people that you see as less worthy than yourselves, yeah. how do you honor it and how do you restructure, I don't use the word myth, yeah. how do you restructure a myth to hold that? And that's what I see people struggling with. Yeah. Uh, somehow uh, the conveyors of this descended, they were not worthy, so it's almost like, in my mind, there's a Persianization of Islam in a certain way. That's one we of the arguments that people make, yes. Worthy Yep. Yes, but over time, this personalization of Islam has um, come to be something bad. I don't see it as something bad, and I don't want to make any arguments about whether it is a personalization or an indigenization of Islam or not. It's beyond me, I don't have training in religious studies or theology or anything like that. From a cultural standpoint, that's a bona fide act of personalization. They take in the invading culture and just make it their own. And about uh, the binding is that, so the story starts with uh, the, the demon saying that 30,000 years ago, Ali uh, did this to me. Ali or Solomon? Uh, no, Ali. Ali did this to me and goes to the Prophet, the Prophet is unable to do this. Uh, Umar, Usman, Abu Bakr are unable to do this. And uh, then Ali, as a young man, uh, comes and uh, unbinds. How did Ali do his, by his, uh, his, his miracle? It's like sort of like trans historical Ali. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And he, it's, yeah. in 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 Tanzia, uh, performances like I said that realism is not important. Ali can be here and then traveling in time two seconds later in Iran, helping the Shia in distress, and then getting back to his prayer, finishing his prayer. In Hmm. Is, is the cursing only in Tazia? Because I attended a, um, a mosque in, uh, Iranian mosque in California, and there were Sunnis and Shias there, and they gave a lecture, and then they put on some music, and it was Lanet, Aisha, uh, oh, yeah, really? and all, half the people left, and I didn't know why. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. then I began to listen and realize what was happening, because mm -hmm. they were cursing Sunnis. Yes. But is that part of the service, or was that the music of Tazia? I always thought it was probably a service. We don't have Aisha in Tazia. I haven't come across any. Okay, uh, so why do they have the Lana? Yeah, that's that's uh, like many people do that. Many like hardcore Shi'is do that. Aisha mm -hmm. is an important like um, figure, uh, like bad mm -hmm. Arab, uh, in addition to Umar. Mm -hmm. So I won't be so I I'm surprised that in California they did this. I won't be surprised if in the city in very religious centers in religious cities in Iran in certain mosques they do this and I know that they do this today mm -hmm. and uh, they are proud of it. But in larger cities or in mosques here in uh, D.C. they don't do this because they know that uh, there are Sunnis here and they don't want to offend them. So that's that was a very um, a conscious move. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah. I have a, a two part question for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe I should preface it. I was, when I was reading the description of your talk, mm -hmm. 
uh, in this Sunni Shi language. Uh, personally, I've always sort of liked President Obama's uh, famous words where he said, there's no red state and uh, or red America and blue America with the United States of America. And I've always seen Islam like that, that there really should be no Sunni and Shia because I've, I've always myself, even though I grew up Muslim American, I always rejected those terms. I've never saw them as legitimate because the Quran does not use Sunni in that way, nor does it use Shia in that way. And, and so my question to you is, um, uh, do people in Iran generally look at anyone who's not a so-called Shia as a Sunni? Um, and then the second question I have is related to that. I've always wondered how people in Iran or anywhere else could be so comfortable with that term Shia because in the Quran, for example, uh, in the 30th chapter there's a verse that warns Muslims not to separate, divide their religion and become Shia. It uses the plural of that word, but it means not to separate yourself into groups or parties. So I wondered how could people reading that verse be so comfortable with that kind of description of himself? Before I start answering that, I can talk about Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, pundits on Fox News and MSNBC do that. Oh. I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I can do that, but I refuse to do that. I can talk about my own personal experiences. And your first question, my, my father is a Shia, so and my mother is a Sunni. And I, it came to me over time, and I, when I think about the past, when I was a kid, my dad used to work uh, for 13 years in the southern port of Andapas that has a huge Sunni population. So I saw my dad taken in by the Sunni population, by the Sunni community, my mother's friends. And um, they had their debates, I can remember that. But at the end of the day, they were friends. Like they, uh, uh, they ate together. And uh, they continued to associate with each other. Flash forward. Uh, my dad uh, returned to his uh, city of birth, Shiraz, and my mother was a minority, a Sunni in a Shia majority. Now, one traumatic experience that my mother just relayed to me, and I uh, share it here, was that like uh, she still remembers and she's still sad and angry that the first question that uh, her uh, mother-in-law asked her was, uh, are Sunnis Taher, clean? So, you see, that tells me uh, uh, enough about the complexity of uh, Persian society, that there are people who are able to, and by the way, right now my mother <laughs> is the favorite of the family. They love her more than my dad. <laughs> so she became the model minority you know, over time. So, I, I, ha I don't have a definitive answer for that. <coughs> We, one thing is missing is uh, an, a public opinion polls in Iran, focusing on the Shias and Sunnis, on Arabs and Iran. These are important national security topics today. And I, that's why I call these writers uh, very bright, that any activist, any, like, activists are all in prison. Like, uh, they, uh, like, accuse them of separatism. And like the Kurds, my mother is a Kurd, they accuse them of separatism, the Arabs accuse them of separatism, and so on and so forth. So answering your second questions, I'm not, I don't, I'm not in the position to answer that because um, I come from culture and literature and uh, politics. Uh, like religious studies is something that we should ask uh, very well. But if, I will give my card to you, but I will ask that question from a couple of people that I trust in Iran. Uh, that's an interesting question, and I will uh, share their responses. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting the depictions in the Iran's role male, whereas most soap operas, a lot of the soap operas in Arabic or even in Persian that uh, showcase prophets, for example, Yusuf. But I actually show yeah, they, they show the of prophets. Since to this day, we have like uh, a few movies about Ali and well, quite a few movies about Hussein, and just very recently a movie about Prophet Muhammad's uh, birth by a very well-known Persian director. The camera never goes up to the face. 
so they don't show the face. They don't like put a character with a veil on it. That's unrealistic in a movie. So they, the camera usually shows a very gentle hand, and that has been criticized as uh, giving a very feminine picture of the book. First of all, thank you very much thank you. for your work. This is thank invaluable. You. I'd like you to take you to 1940 in, in Poland, where the, the label of other was applied to Jews, and the distinction between the inhumanity of the Jews and the humanity of the Christians was then presented to the public. And you have the public standing over mass graves as people are being executed because they're not human, they're, they're, the, they're the other. So you can apply this model to any place where there is conflict to justify the just cause of killing another human being. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for bringing this up. Um, I should explain something that uh, now, um, um, what happens to the Arab other in Persian literature is uh, very much like what happened to the Jews or any other subaltern or prosecuted uh, group of people. But at the same time, I should mention this, that there is absolutely no evidence of execution of mass killing of the Arabs or the Sunnis in all. But during the time of the Safavids, historical works tell us like 20,000 in a day I don't know whether we can believe them or not, but definitely something happened at that time. But in modern Iran, absolutely but there the is not. The Safavids didn't kill Arabs; they killed Sunnis. The Sunnis, yes. The yeah, Sunni so they, and they killed Sunnis in places like near Shiraz. They were not Arabs. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were 100% Persian-speaking Sunni. Mm -hmm. uh, and Qazvin in the north and stuff. Yes. So the, there's there the, the Sunni and the Arab uh, is clearly distinct. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely use the uh, like uh, theories of trauma studies mm -hmm. that are based on the Holocaust, and I use them in order to understand, to make sense of the like the what the trauma that the uh, Persian writers are feeling is very much like a Jew being attacked by the Nazis. But at the same time, we should in in the future like work on work. Uh, preparing, perhaps I'm preparing, I definitely need to put the disclaimer that we can use the theory that the like affinities are out there, but are there, but the differences should be mentioned that Arabs in Iran or the Sunnis in Iran should never probably be compared with the plights of the Jews in the hands of the Nazis. But the discourse Aryanism and anti Semitism that the Iranians in the twenties are using, yes comes from, unfortunately, from the Nazis. And Iran at the time, this is the time, by the way, that Iran changed its name from Persia to Iran. Iran means area, the land of Arabs. So they completely bought it out of ignorance. There was no other like discourse that could help them like um, be better people or pretend to be better people. They unfortunately learned it from the Germans and Gubinio, a French philosopher who traveled to Iran and told the intellectuals in Iran that you are great people, just just hate these Arabs like us. Because they you remember, you see you had the Achaemenians and Sasanians. You used to be like ruling the whole like the globe, basically, at the time. And the Iranians had completely forgotten. Some people say forgotten, I say we remembered. They had basically koshered their pre-Islamic minds by building a mosque behind it and calling it Masjid al-Madar Sulaiman, the Chrysopolis. They called it the Mosque of Solomon's Mother because they took some stones from Chrysopolis and built a mosque and they called it mosque. They made it kosher, right? So they made it their own, so that other people won't destroy it as signs of idolatry and kings and tabut. Hmm? These are very like important moments in Persian history. Yes. Is there any parallel kind of literature in the Arab world about Persian? Definitely should be. 
but I'm not aware. There, I mean, there is, uh, so what happens, um, especially in 1979, I mean, there's a little bit of anti, especially in the 19th century, it comes out of South Asia, India, there's a lot of Sunni Shiite tension. Um, some writ books get written, anti Shiite books get written by a famous guy named Shah Abdul Aziz, died in, uh, in 1825. And then that is a digest of that produced in the early 20th century uh, by uh, one of the Alusi family members, I think. And then that gets republished in, in, the, in, the, in the late 20th century, around the night after the revolution, Iranian revolution. And then it's just a floodgates open up uh, because all the different groups that get uh, got funding from Saudi Arabia, whether in the U.S. or anywhere else, I mean, they would just get deluged with free material, anti-Iranian, anti-Shiite material. They get, you know, people would get paid to write and forge. And do, so you have like a, you know, blossoming of uh, anti-Shiite material. But that's, I mean, you can just... There's a little bit of it before 1979, but 1979 is like, you know, explosion of this material. But Saddam Hussein used that in order yeah. to, like, um, ideologically justify his war against the Majus. He called the Iranians the Majus as crypto Zoroastrians. Mm -hmm. And I found, like, this is, uh, let me say this, this is very funny, that in, an, in a library in India, I came across a pamphlet by Saddam Hussein in Persia. I never knew that he wrote actually in Persian, translated. But in that, he says that just uh, accept, the, accept the fact that you are Majus, and Majus is a very like, contemptuous term for the, for the fire worshippers, for Zoroastrians. And he said that we, you are the inferior people, we are attacking you because we are superior, we hold like we, the real Islam is with us, and so on. So. Yeah, so, but as far as I know, uh, I don't know any other me on the other side working on the image of Iranians, but there was tremendous amount of material that needs to be worked. You have to remember, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you have to remember, like, you know, that the, for, since probably you can go back to the 1200s until the 1800s, the court language from everywhere from Istanbul to Delhi was Persian. I mean, their artistic style was Persian, right? They were, uh, all the, almost all the scholars who built Sunni Islam from the 800s onward were Persian. Uh, so, I mean, there <laughs> there were all these, the great, the Hadith scholars whose books are quoted in Saudi Arabia, they all, their mother tongue, when they went home and they were yelling at their kids, were speaking in Persian. Yes. Now, just to follow follow that up, I was curious, you talk, you did start with medieval uh, interactions and imagery. But you didn't mention the thing that usually gets mentioned when you talk about Persian Arab literary tensions in this eighth century and so on with the Shuhubiya. Uh Is there any relationship between the Shuhubiya and the kind of things you're talking about? Like one of the first tasks that I created for myself is to um, create a niche for myself. and. Uh, Anybody, like the common wisdom has it that it all started with the, with the show here. And that's true. And that's 100% true. And not everything has been translated, but Abu Nawaz and others are fierce anti-Arab writers. It's not an, it's hard to say whether it's an ethnic or a religious competition, mm -hmm. animosity. It's, it's very complicated. But yes, there is a huge like repertoire of texts out there. But for my research, I wanted to make a contribution to the field by not again starting with the Shubi. Mm -hmm. And there is another reason that my Arabic is not as good as my Persian. So these texts are mostly in Arabic, and it's very hard to read them. So I decided to start after the Shubi. And one of the things that I have here, yes, you are completely right, that if you read early Islamic era, like Shubi, um, debates, they basically demean every aspect of Arab life, from mm -hmm. the cane, from the like, rhetorical style. They're already talking about lizard ears. Uh, yeah, yes, 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 that's very true. And here you will see that this is like a like a uh, 5,000 line poem. This is just only one, mm -hmm. like a couple of pages of this poem that one by one 
they just takhtae, like they, um, they I don't know what takhtae in English, just takhtae in English. They um, demean and denigrate, they attack uh, a, um, the aspects of our life that they are so proud. Of. Yes, you can definitely argue that uh, shubi, uh, like the polemics, are out there and as a uh, like um, source of ideology, but how much these writers actually read Arabic and actually connected to those is a matter of, I don't know, one thing that I will be doing this afternoon is to see whether Asadi to see could read Arabic. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah, another, yeah, I think another big difference is that these Shubi writers are in places like Baghdad. I mean, so they're, they're not like in Tehran writing stuff about people in Baghdad. They're in Baghdad writing about stuff about these desert Arabs who live to the south. Or, you know, so the whole, like, you know, uh, and it's almost like uh, insulting the past of the early Umayyads and stuff, as, a, as opposed to, for them, their Islamic world was a Persian world. Mm -hmm. and and why am I telling you this stuff? You're my <laughs> professor, right? And to be honest with you, it's like a coping mechanism, that they have come to accept this religion, like the Shubis, or the first uh, two, three hundred years, the Muslim scholars, Hadith uh, collectors and historians, are, are more Catholic than Pope. Mm -hmm. They have, uh, they practice this now more than even, they say, more than the Arabs. But over time they started to understand that, okay, we have fully dissolved ourselves in the religion, but why we are treated as second, what's the expression, second citizens? Second class citizens by the mm -hmm. Arabs. Because they are from the Quraysh, because they speak Arabic, and we have <coughs> so many funny poems about Arabic being the language of heaven and Persian being the language of hell. <laughs> um, much, much of the uh, knowledge base about you know, the, the Muslim world has come from largely historians or theologians and so forth. And I was wondering, in the, in the contemporary uh, analysis, do you, have you come across any um, uh, literary Critics and a psychologist or psychiatrist. Uh, one of the things I, that I've always tried to get uh, some psychiatrists, uh, assuming they were Sunni, uh, uh, well, I mean, they were agnostics, you know, uh, to, to, to do more of a psychological uh, and, and a, uh, you know, more like a, even a Joseph Campbell type of uh, study, you know. Uh, of, of the literature and you know, across more contemporary literature. And I wonder if you know that Very good question, very good question. And uh, to follow up with Dr. Brown's, there is no money in that. Yeah. There is tremendous amount of money on making wars. Yeah. And there is no drive. There is no like um, uh, interest, sorry. There is no money in it on, on either side. side. Iran is basically impoverished in yeah. its... Um, um, it does not have enough con enough money to put into like psychological rehabilitation of the yeah. traumatized Shi'is or Sunnis of Sunnis, Sunni minority, or they don't care uh, because they uh, are afraid of the Sunni minority of Iran because they speak other languages other than Persian, and they very much like the our second generation Iranian Americans here. Yeah. They are not clear. Did you know that they are not clear because they have ties to Iran. Oh really? Extra national ties. They you know, they, it, they justify it and like this intelligence. I don't know whatever whatever companies they justify it in a very <laughs> believable manner. They said you have a grandmother there. What if they adopt your grandmother? The same thing happens in Iran. Have been happening in Iran for the past 40 years. Yeah. The Baluts have families are drawn by the map makers and I don't know uh, by statesmen. Like ordinary people, like in ordinary, if you go to Baluch, if you go to Kurdistan, there are no actual walls. There are no actual walls. You can, there's a hill you can cross and go visit your family on the other side of the thing. And this is what scares people. This is what our second gens are paying a high price for that. So if uh, over time I've been thinking about like probably an NGO can start doing that or at least start like creating the idea that yeah. would be used by certain like trauma experts, yeah. psychologists. Well, that's what I was but thinking. right now I'm not aware of anybody even remotely interested in it. It's unfortunate.
Well, thank you very much, Thanks so much. I took a lot of questions. You can see all of it.